Hello and welcome to the fall line with chaos and company. I'm Dave Caper and I'm here with my buddy, Angela Ross. Hey, Angelo. Hi, Dave. Hey, we, we were talking in our last podcast, Angelo, about prepping for the season and how we prep for um, our teaching. You asked me a question like, what was I doing to prep for my teaching? And, you know, I, I, I put out there that I was, you know, looking at um, some things in the way I do now. And I started to think about, have I always thought that way? Have I always prepped this way? And, and I don't, um, or I haven't. In the past, I had a lot of part-oriented type stuff that I would have, like, I'm going to go out and work on some edging skills. So what activities would I do? And I'd have them listed out. What kind of rotary movements am I going to work on? I'd even go as much to go, you know what, when I'm doing a beginner lesson, what are the parts? What do I do? What's the order? Mm -hmm. When I'm working with someone in the intermediate zone, I'd be like, okay, what do I do in that lesson? What do I work on with them? And I put, you know, lesson plans together. Well, if I'm working on how they're turning their legs more, I do this, this, and this. If I'm working on how I need to get them their joints to move more, I do this, this, and this. And I'd have it listed on my three by five cards. And I tend not to do that now. I look more at how I'm going to set up the learning environment in terms of, you know, a lot of people say that's the learning environment, but I was looking more at the tech pieces of that versus now I'll think about, okay, if I'm going to go out this year and work with the group on, on getting their legs to turn more than the upper body, where am I going to do that on the hill? Can I do it differently than I have been? Like, how can I do it? So they notice it or able to do it more. Am I, can I use different terrain? Would it be easier to do it on something flatter? Would it be easier to do it somewhere um, different that they felt it more? Like if we went into like, not a, not bumps, but something uneven, would they notice the differences of where they were balancing fore and aft on the ski? Those pressure differences that they'd be forced to be more in the middle though. They'd be forced to deal with those forces that in, when we're doing just a pivot slip down the hill, which so many people do, that they, they don't move. They just try to stay in that one place. So can I do different? So I look more of, I think, in a, in a bigger picture way of how I can get them to do things by how can I change the environment? How can I do the task differently mm -hmm. and, and get to them? Maybe even how I could describe it differently. How can I describe what I want them to do? Will those words make more of an impact? Um, I was just curious if you were thinking that way, that in the past you've done things differently than now preparing. I, well, definitely I do. I, I think it's, I think it's a normal tendency for any new teacher in any new, in any new field to be preoccupied with the, with the technical aspects of it first. You know, I was a, I was a high school biology teacher for 20 years. Um, and I, I know my first couple of years, my primary concern was the content. It was you know, do I know all the parts of the Krebs cycle? Can I talk about the light and dark reactions of photosynthesis? Because I think it's a belief that that's where you have the greatest chance of failure. If, a, if somebody asks you a question and you can't answer it, you look like you don't know your content. But where, where you know, you can only spend your energy in so many places at one time. And while you're focused on content, you're ignoring the things you're talking about now, which is environment, which is uh, relationships with, with people, which is your audience, you know? Um, I think it's it's the sign of a mature teacher, you know, some would call it a master teacher, to consider the things you're considering now, where you're, you're in a place where the content, the technical technical content isn't much of a challenge for you at this point something, you know, we switch from four skills to five fundamentals. That's, that's just a matter of assimilating that new information. It's like, oh, okay. I, I see what they did there, you know, but when you're talking about snow conditions and the mood of your group and the temperature and which mountain you're on, those things are, are, um, falling within your realm of consideration now because you, you're quite experienced at it. So I think that's that's the hallmark of an experienced teacher. Yeah, yeah and I think a lot of folks, they get stuck in that part-oriented way of doing things and they list things out because this has worked for them. Because I needed that. I needed that when I first started. Because um, when I first started, you know, you go through the training for the 
for the whole mountain. You go through, what, what is it, like eight, ten hours maybe? Yeah. And, and I think now it's probably even less of the technical pieces of, of teaching skiing. There's so much of other things you have to get from the whole mountain. Um, how do you get the, how do you get the kids signed in? How do you get them out of the room? How do you get them on the hill? And there's so many parts and pieces that I, and I was like, man, I need to figure out how to teach skiing. And <laughs> I didn't have the content. Right. And when I figured out, started figuring out the content, it, it worked, but I was still missing that piece of the connection that you said to the people. And I, I do know now I try to look more at, so when I'm prepping, I'm thinking more about how things went last year in terms of was I, were I, able, was I able to get people to do certain things in certain situations? How can I change those situations? But I think a lot of people, if they start with that, some people just try to do that, but don't have the understanding of the content and think they're getting a good lesson out there, but they're, they're making people happy in terms of they had a great time, but there's not a lot of content on it. So the the two need to join. So I don't think that one's right or the other. Like you said, I, a lot of people need that part stuff when they start. We all need to own that content. And um, I just, I didn't, it was funny because after we got off the last podcast, I'm like, I don't think I, I've never, I haven't always prepared the way I do now. That's an evolution over time that I've, I've had, I've built. We have a tendency to look at at lessons we teach uh, according to Bloom's taxonomy. Can you can on the low end, you can name something, you can put it in a list. As you get toward the middle, you can evaluate it. As you get up toward the top, or I'm sorry, at the middle, you can analyze it, and you get up toward the top, you're synthesizing and, and evaluating and those sorts of things. But look at a look at a ski teaching career. Look at a 30 or 35 year ski teaching career under the same lens as, as from from a Bloom's perspective. In your first couple of years, you're just figuring out how to name things. This is rotary. This is edging. This is pressure management, right? You can list them. As you get a little bit more into it, you can, you can, you get up to that analysis portion and we literally call it movement analysis. It's a, it's an instructor's ability finally to take those pieces that at first you could list and now use them to watch a skier come down the hill and say, okay, this is what I see happening, right? But then, like you say, a lot of people get stuck at that spot where, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable now. I can do movement analysis. I can watch that person ski down the hill. I can pick out some sort of thing. I can provide a lesson and they leave a better skier than they showed up or snowboarder. And it's easy to stop there because it's comfortable. That's the job. You're doing the nuts yeah. and bolts of the job. But there's more beyond that. So you get into that that synthesis piece of it. You get into that evaluation piece of it, right? And a lot of that's internal evaluation. You're you're reflecting on what kind of a job you actually did, you know. Or like you say, you're evaluating the conditions of the day. You're evaluating the the physical fitness of your group and you're considering these things now but i don't i don't know that it's it's entirely possible or at least probable for a, a newer instructor to do those things you have to grow into it yeah yeah because I, th- I now it's a lot of you know ex- exploration play you know and i've been like that for a, quite a while i mean i love to go out and just play on the hill um ski different lines um, you know, you go out with the staff when I'm at the home hill, I go back to the home hill for a few days after doing some events and you go out with them and they go out first morning, ski one trail. You go out with them the next morning, they ski the same trail again. They ski the same lines and I'll, I'll go up again with them and say, everybody ski a different line. You all skied same line today as you skied yesterday first run. I want you to ski a different line. And a lot of times they'll go, well, why? I like that line over there. And I'm like, well, just try it. Go explore. See if you have to do some, something different skiing that other line. Maybe take a line that goes on a diagonal across the hill. You know, we get to get out there early in the morning, sometimes before even public is out there. So we got the whole hill. It's like ski across the hill. You know, try to get that effect, even though if it's a, a great straight down fall line, get that where it's the double fall line that it isn't, but you're skiing the diagonal. And they've got to do something different one turn to the next. And it's just trying to get them to explore is really hard. And that's where I look more. I try to figure out how can I set up situations that they explore the fundamentals of skiing? How can they explore 
how the ski tips, how they can explore different turns of how they have to change leg lengths or absorb certain terrain. And I don't think that they do that a lot in their own training. And I don't think they do it a lot in their, especially lower level lessons to allow people to explore. You, know, you don't see them a group, uh, coaches out very often with a low level group of wedge turners having them ski different lines on the snow across the hill to try to figure out what they're doing differently with their skis. And I think that's missing from helping skiers become better. Um, they're locked into one type of skiing. Well, I think, you know, they, they do what they see. And a lot yeah. of training clinics are formulaic, you know, because yeah. a lot of, a lot of times people on, on snow sports schools, the ones who, who attain, trainer status are the ones who've reached that analysis piece of the that large blooms idea that i was talking about earlier oh this this person can do movement analysis therefore he or she qualifies to be a trainer which isn't entirely untrue but if that person hasn't developed a, a belief in play they're not going to present that to the newer instructors and so you don't see it in their in their lessons either and, and what you're talking about is interesting because there, there's a difference between free play and guided play, you know, where like if, if I go out by myself, um, I may just feel like skiing or snowboarding, whichever, you know, soup du jour. Um, if I just feel like going out and doing it, maybe to blow off some steam or whatever, I, I'll ride without regard to where I am or what's coming next, just go look for things that look great. Go thing, look for stuff that looks fun. If I'm in more of a, a, a mindset where I'm, I'm working towards something, you know, like I want to get better at board slides on my snowboard, I'll go to the park and find a, you know, find a park with nobody in it, first of all, because I don't want anybody to watch me. And then I'll find a box that's, you know, small enough for me to feel comfortable on and I'll do some board slides on my snowboard. Now, it's partially play because it's really fun. I enjoy it, yeah. but it's purposeful. So there's a guided play component to it because there's an end result. You know, yeah. maybe, maybe, um, I don't mean, you know, maybe I want to do FS1 or 2 on my snowboard, something like that. So there's a goal in mind, which makes it purposeful play. And I think what you're describing with just the, just the idea of taking that run down the same line and say, you know, go, go from, uh, we're on the left up here, finish this run on the bottom right of the slope, may not have occurred to somebody else. You're turning that into, you know, you're, you're flirting with guided play there. Because I know you're going to ask them a question when you get to the bottom. You know, yeah, yeah. On your chairlift ride, you're going to drill them, right? Yeah, But it, it, does, it ups the fun factor, but it also ups the learning factor at the same time and the self-coaching factor, which yeah. is really, really important for a, for a good teacher to be able to do is turn their students into self-coaches, you know, yeah. make, make yourself obsolete. I think I talked about that last yeah, time. Yeah, you did. Yeah. It's about identifying, like you have to identify that there was success there, may not feel successful to them at first, trying to incorporate this new move, this new movement pattern might feel really awkward, but it's, you know, it's more efficient, it looks great. But when you can get them to identify what it felt like, it's like, oh, how, you know, how was that different? They're like, oh, well, I felt my lateral obliques. I never feel that. And you're like, cool. That's yeah. the sensation you can chase. But now it's about, you know, after there's some, some practice and a little bit mastery, it's like, all right, well, let's go try it on that mellower pitch. See if it, see if it works the same when the speed is reduced and the pitch is reduced and what you know then go to something a little bit steeper then maybe take it to the to the half pipe then maybe take it to the bumps and really explore variety in terrain you're starting to instill those things that you to accept as normal now as a mature coach yeah it's it's interesting too because you have to work in because a lot of folks don't want to do it they have a hard time with that exploration it's like well just test, tell me what i need to do show me what it is and let me do it and they don't realize that the move is not or just skiing and snowboarding, you need to explore to feel the different forces. But it, but it puts into there that people skills part that we've been kind of, you know, we've really implored into our learning connection the last few years and definitely coming in the next couple that when you do that, a lot of people resist and you have to figure out ways to ease into it. 
Because, you know, I have thrown out stuff and they're like, why would we do that? I don't want to do that. You know, even just like a simple side slip, like side slip fast, now side slip slow. Well, I was trained that we want to side slip at a consistent rate of speed down the hill. And I'm like, well, that might be a final form, but how do you slide? How do, what do you do to be able to get the side slip faster? What do you do to side slip to go slower? How do you change the rate? You know, so it's starting to manipulate the edge of the ski, but they don't explore that a lot. And they resist it, I think, because they're trying to get to that perfect move. What's the perfect way of doing it? Versus looking more of the holistic of how do I apply how I use my ski against the snow and maybe use the side slip as a vehicle. You know, they're not looking at the bigger picture of how it, how it works into their overall skiing or when they use it out there. Because there's quite a few times coming down them icy bumps, I might have to throw them skis sideways in the place. And, and, you know, it might only be a couple turns or somebody, one of our coaches might say, uh, Capron, you had to do that about 20 times. But, I mean, they're not seeing where it fits in it's that perfect training i need to just do it this speed this trail right like this every wedge has to be exactly the same size my wedge turns at the same speed you know that it's tough sometimes so you have to really i mean i i find not everybody's just willing to go play don't you, they you, learn it, that from us though like yes i mean because yes we're, we're we part of what we do is we're a certifying group <laughs> so there's so in that case there's a right way to do it. Yes. This is what this is what I want to see right now because I'm going to throw a score at this. But we our our ski instruction, probably and and more than snowboard instruction, I assume, is really geared toward that belief that there is there is a right way to do it and a yeah. wrong way to do it, and that infiltrates the locker room. But that that happens even before the certification process starts for somebody. Like imagine, yeah. I, mean, I mean, you you were a new instructor at one time, right? You walk in, oh, yeah. you're the new guy. You have yeah. no idea that something like ski technique even exists. And you find Correct. yourself in this group with strangers and somebody out in front talking who appears to know what he or she is talking about. And yeah. then you're asked to do some task. And it's like, right. oh, well, let's let's side slip. You're like, what the hell side slip? And then you see it <laughs> and you try it and it's hard. And other people can do it better and you may fall down and people are falling down. It's like a minefield of bodies out there all of a sudden. And it's like you go into the locker room at the end of the day with with this. I mean, for me, it was humbling. It's like, oh, my God, like there's an entire world of, of yeah. stuff to know here. But that yeah. that also probably is the the first moment, you know, and, and it and I think a lot of times it solidifies it. But it's the first time in somebody's ski teaching career where they start to look at it from a training mindset as opposed to just an enjoyment mindset but we i would argue we we do a lot to create that perception ourselves we as uh psia members we as more experienced trainers on our on our staffs we're partially to blame for that or largely you know i'd say more than partially Largely. Me included. <laughs> we, we do. I mean, we, we, they want the end result. We want to help them get to the end result, you know, which so many of them that strive for that goal of certification. And those, those tasks do have some certain outcomes so that we have some consistency. But to also use those assessment activities to play around, to grow our skiing, you know, we got to make, we, I think it's a message we have to make sure we get out there. And, and I just wanted from our last podcast where we were kind of talking about how we prepared. I just thought it was a good conversation to, to make sure that people knew that there's different ways to prepare. And I think different levels, different experience levels that you've come in. Um, I think all of us will, will still say that we like to read stuff about skiing, and not just the gear guide as the gear guides are coming in now and I've been looking through them, but um you know, looking at our at old manuals, looking at just ski books, looking at all, anything you can that relates to how people move, even those boring textbooks on biomechanics and stuff. But, but I mean, that's still important, I think, for all of us. We all looked at, but I didn't want to leave it like we did last time because I think the way we used to prepare, I know I did, was important to get to the point I am now. And, and I think sometimes people try to emulate exactly how we may prepare or what we do now and without letting them know what we used to do because it was a lot different when like you said when i was that new pro there were things i had to do then to be able to know what i was going to say out in the hill um and and that stuff's been has 
been a little, you know, that becomes easier with the content and the MA becomes easier. I think MA, the movement assessment, movement analysis piece, when we're looking at skiers and riders is probably the hardest thing to really gain that ability in real time watching somebody come down the hill is hard for most all ski and snowboard instructors. I think there's another piece of this too that's that's maybe a different topic, but a couple of the things you said reminded me of it. I, I think there's a real guilt inherent in American education, whether it's in the classroom um, or or on the ski hill. There's this there's this supposition that the teacher has the responsibility to get the student to meet the teacher's goals by the end of the lesson. And we feel like failures if we don't. But it, but a lot of times I think we we forget ourselves how long it took us to develop the skills that we have. And I and I, you know, I think where it's coming from is a place of generosity. You want you want somebody to get really good at something quickly, but the reality of the situation is it it takes a lot of time and a lot of experience and a lot of miles and a lot of hours to develop the touch to even recognize some of the things that we're talking about, you know, and yeah. development, like development in terms of time isn't factored into training programs a lot of time. It's like, oh, this week we're doing rotary. Oh, next week's edging and <laughs> the following week's pressure, regardless of the conditions and regardless of, you know, if the people grasp anything from the first concept or not, rather, rather than, than taking it, little more slowly maybe looking at a multi-year training program for new instructors you know and and allowing people to develop i when i started as a ski teacher this is 1990 i was a terrible skier i in terms of efficiency you know like like if the guys who sat around and engineered the skis watched me ski on those skis they would probably come over and ask me not to ski on them anymore because my uh -huh. technique didn't match the engineer uh -huh. what i did have going for me is i was 18 years old and i had been doing it non-stop for for season after season in the bumps where i probably had no business being but i had a certain raw skill set that then when I got to the ski school and they could work with me and recognize there was actually something there that might be worth something, I began to refine it. But I see a lot of folks coming into the game these days older in life. You know, the kids the ki the retired or the kids went to college and I didn't really ski that much. I was a recreational skier. Now I have free time. I think I'll be a ski instructor. And they may not have developed I may not have had the benefit of all the hours on the hill year after year after year to develop a, 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 a foundational comfort level. So everything for them at that point is new, you know, and we come at them so fast, but sometimes the best teachers back off. Yeah. That's enough. You know, there's only one run. Yeah. yeah, it's enough. It's all you need. Come find me tomorrow, yeah. you know. You know, I was, I was working with someone who had a lot more knowledge than me at that point, still does. And we were watching some people do some stuff on snow. And she wasn't a ski instructor. She's a motor learning specialist. She skis, good, good skier, but she's a motor learning specialist, professor at a college here in New Hampshire um, in motor learning. And she, I'm watching them and, and someone in the group that were standing there watching the group, she had them doing something. And uh, the, someone said, well, they're not learning anything. And she says, how do you know that? Just, well, they're not doing it right yet. And she said, just because they're not doing it yet, what you want them to do doesn't mean they're not learning. If they're moving, they're learning. And if you can guide them through that process, you might, it might take a while. You're not going to see them just be able to do fine tuned movements right away. She had us do this juggling exercise for a week before she came and worked with us. And we had to juggle so many times a day and we had to build it up. Like we started, it was like, twice a day and then with one ball with two balls and to go to three balls she had a whole process we had to do over like a seven day period and we had to record how many times we were able to do it to see how good we got at juggling and we came in and we had the results we had to record how many times we were able to do the two balls in one hand all that stuff and and all of us were terrible at it. you know none of us knew how to juggle 
and we were still after seven days, still terrible. And she's like, well, if you can't learn how to juggle in a week, how do you expect people to learn how to ski in two hours? Great. And I thought there is, I mean, and it was interesting because it's like, we, we expect our expectations are for such quick response. And, and that's because people want it. That's what they want to pay for. Mm -hmm. But they want to just, and we look at all sports, it takes time. We watch our kids develop when they play, you know, high school sports or sports through elementary school into junior high. And, you know, you don't see a big change each practice. You see it over the time of the season or year to year. Um, you know, it's interesting. But learning, you know, it was, it was, it's always stuck with me that just because they're not doing it yet doesn't mean they're not learning from what you're doing with them. That they are learning, but just haven't figured out how to do it in – Unefficient way yet. One of the m moments I had in my educational career that was it was kind of eye opening in terms of time. I was a college admission counselor for a couple of years at my alma mater, and and I remember my first. I got hired in the summer, so we were bringing in this class of freshmen, and it's chaotic. I mean, it's completely hectic for multiple weeks running up to this day where the students move in right but i remember coming moving days on a sunday typically i remember coming to work on monday and i was still in that frantic mindset for how busy we had been for the last couple of weeks and uh the dean of our department i, I don't know i must have been flipping out and, the, and the, the dean of our department said hey you can relax we got them for four years now <laughs> and i was like oh and that it slowed things down in my mind it reminds me also of this, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Dirt Rag Magazine. It was a mountain bike yeah. magazine um, published in Pittsburgh. It began in the 80s and unfortunately just, just shut their doors last summer. But it was, it was a pretty well-known mountain bike magazine. And the editor was a guy named Maurice. And I remember in the 90s at some point opening up and saw letters to the editor. And it said, Dear Maurice, how do I get in shape to ride my mountain bike? And the kid's name was there. And afterward, it said 14 years old, right? And Maurice respo Maurice's response was, ride your mountain bike. <laughs> ride your mountain bike. And I thought, <laughs> how brilliant. That's so insightful, yeah. right? But we, yeah. don't, we don't allow people to ride their skis. We don't allow people to ride right. their snowboard without bom bombarding them with cognitive information overloads. Yeah. You're so overloaded in, in your brain with these things that we're training, how can you possibly pay attention to what's happening with your, your body experience? Yeah. You know? And then that becomes there yeah. too. Yeah. I, th I think if we can simplify that cognitive piece, give a chunk and work on it for not just two runs, work on it for the day, mm -hmm. you know, change situation of terrain of different trails, different speeds. Um, let it explore it. I think, I think people will have a much greater success of improving. I know they will. And, and I, and I know, and I believe, you know, they will do better at their exams if that's their goal. Mm -hmm. I mean, the more they explore how to use the skis in the snow at different speeds, whether it be a wedge turn, a side slip, it, it's so hard sometimes to get folks to change those things. Just do you wedge turn somewhere where it's hard? And that might not be steeper. I mean, do wedge turns on the flattest, flattest terrain that barely has momentum that you can't do, you know, so you're pointing your skis back up the hill. You can't keep momentum going. How do you ski more in the fall line doing wedge turns? You know, and how do you keep it going without stopping? Um, you know, things like that. You know, challenge yourself to, and, and, and then make it a game, man. I'd stand there with you and go, all right, we're going down this hill here. Let's see. Here's the line straight in the thing. We got to make 10 turns from here to that point, all the same. We can't stop and have it be wedge turns and really flat terrain. And then, of course, everyone will say, well, we didn't wax your, our skis like you did. <laughs> well, there you learn something else. <laughs> well, they learned something else. <laughs> Maybe you should wax your skis more often. <laughs> I, I, if I have somebody at my home mountain who's working on a particular skill, and I see that they they did it. You know, they they maybe didn't recognize they did it, but I see they did. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, that was it. And I'll, the homework assignment is you have to ski that across the entire front side of the mountain, and then ski it on every hill on the back side of the mountain before we talk about it again. Yeah. And if that if they can get that done in a day, if there aren't many lessons, and they can 
they can ski. You know, that, that would take a day, half a day yeah. at, 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 at my home resort. Or if they're busy and they don't get to do it until, you know, finish it tomorrow and I'll catch you next weekend. But it, I want it to sink in and I want it to sink yeah. in on those different pitches. And some of those, um, some of those trails have curves that bend the other direction. So now you're doing it both directions around the curve and fall line pitches a different way. But it, you know, it, I think a, a typical tendency in clinics is like, if you, if you see some glimmer of change, you move on to the next thing. Yeah. Well, that thing's gone. The first thing's gone. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they've mastered that. Let's move on to the next thing. Yeah. So yeah, this was a, this was a great talk on that. I think we needed to do this to, um, to, to let folks know that, the way we prepare now may be different than we did, which it is. And it was different 20 years ago from what it was 10 years ago for me. And um, you, know, you got to find that right balance of where you're at. You had talked about earlier, that self-awareness. So I think that's, hopefully this helps some folks to um, maybe, you know, we expanded a little bit on, on maybe some ways to prepare for the year. And uh, hopefully they enjoyed the talk. Thanks for listening in. Always good to talk with you again, Angelo. Yep, always a and, pleasure. Uh, yeah. Until next time. Hopefully soon we'll be on snow talking together, possibly. Hope so. All righty. All right. See you later, buddy. See ya.